Let's recap this week's headlines from Sri Lanka. Bankrupt Sri Lanka asks citizens abroad to send home cash. 13 Lankan banks placed on rating watch negative. Sri Lanka defaults on $51 billion external debt. To Sri Lanka now and the desperate economic problems there. The government is planning big spending cuts, saying that it's barely enough money to pay salaries and pensions of public servants. For a fleeting second, you may have heard that there was a financial collapse and a subsequent uprising in the small island nation of Sri Lanka. But do you know what really happened? The country's most chaotic day in months of political turmoil. Tens of thousands of people storming the presidential palace and prime minister's home. Protesters holding President Gotabaya Rajapaksha responsible for the nation's economic meltdown, setting off acute shortages of essential items like food, fuel, medicine, and other necessities. Motorists, tuk-tuk drivers, and taxi drivers queue for fuel and jostle for fuel in this queue that I hear is stretching four to five kilometers. And this is the economic reality that the new president of Sri Lanka has to fix. Over the last two years, the people of Sri Lanka have experienced power cuts, expanding seven, sometimes 10 hours a day, and relentless queues for gas and skyrocketing prices for everyday goods. All of which pushed the masses to publicly protest against the governing body. But what are the events and decisions that led the country to this point? Was the country's covid fuel financial crisis long coming? The international media has had speculations on the factors that brought the nation to its knees from the pandemic. The country has run out of money and the economy is in free fall. There are shortages of food, fuel and medicine. The currency has crashed and prices for everything are sky high. To the push to go organic farming overnight. In April 2021, a ban was imposed. Sri Lankan government suddenly decided and declared that nationwide, no chemical fertilizers and pesticides will be imported anymore. All the farmers will have to use organic pesticides and fertilizers. To the Chinese debt. After the rebel war of 2009, Sri Lanka sought China's financial help. The country took loans worth $45 billion from various countries, including more than $8 billion from China. And the corruption that runs deep in a dynasty that has wielded power for two decades. The youngest brother, Basil, the ex-finance minister, was nicknamed Mr. 10% for allegedly taking millions in commissions from government contracts. In 2015, he was charged with stealing $530,000 from a welfare housing program. In this podcast, we probe into all the speculations with leading Sri Lankan politicians, both from the governing party and the opposition journalists, activists and researchers. And I can assure you what we found in these conversations will surprise you. It's been an interesting journey revisiting my old memories of living in Sri Lanka during a civil war. My roots are in the island, though I've traveled and lived globally for decades, and I have been curious about where the thread to the past will take me. So, join me, Desh, a storyteller and a member of the Sri Lankan diaspora, in my quest to find answers to the question, what the hell happened to Sri Lanka? Let's start at the beginning, the real beginning. I spoke with some brilliant minds in different fields to help shed light on the bigger picture on the island. How did the civil unrest on the island begin? Is democracy failing? Why is democracy failing? Or is it failing at all? How does that connect with the economy? And what is the deal with the Rajapakshas? What is the truth from myth? Sri Lanka has been loaded as the oldest democracy in Asia, and yet power has always been in the hands of the elites, and this dynamic has gone hand in hand with recurring conflict. I'm curious about the history that birthed what we are experiencing today. 
This is war correspondent and journalist Asif Fuad and field researcher Sarala Emmanuel. What we need to understand is the civil war is uh, probably kind of the tip of the iceberg, but we can trace the origins or the root causes of the conflict way back to 1948, which was even before 1948, which was uh, the pre-independence uh, era of Ceylon, as what Sri Lanka was known. And it is no secret that the British colonial administration at the time used divide and conquer policy in many of its crown colonies. The political um, reasons go back to how we negotiated independence from the British in 1948. So from that time onwards, Sri Lanka's um, nation was imagined and constructed as a majoritarian Sinhala Buddhist nation. Initially, we experienced uh, anti-Muslim riots back in 1915. And several years before that, probably, I believe it was around 1883, where the Kotahena riots, which uh, uh, occurred uh, targeting uh, the Roman Catholic uh, population. So the main cause for most of these communal and uh, ethno-religious riots was caused by a combination of factors. One is that it's mainly primarily based on a supremacist ideology where several scholars, even Enlightenment era scholars, talk about tyranny of the majority. At that time, there was a nationalistic drive uh, culminated with ethno-religious politics. So at that point, we can see that this basically uh, the ethno centric politics and the ethnocentric rhetoric which later moved on during the post-independence era was kind of reshaping Sri Lanka's political culture. So just after gaining independence in 1948, there was the disenfranchisement of the Indian origin Tamils who were brought to the central province by uh, the colonial rulers, the British at the time, in order for them to work in the plantation sector. And from the word go, like 1948 itself, the Tamil plantation communities were disenfranchised. Then we have uh, language rights-based discrimination, land conflicts, and coming to various kind of structural and legal constitutional discriminations against minorities, which of course were some of the root causes for the war as well, right? So soon after, this was during DSA Nanayaka's period, who was the first prime minister. And uh, soon after that, we uh, experienced uh, the Sinhala only policy, which was advocated by SWRD Bandar Nayaka who was the founding member of the Sri Lanka Freedom Party. So SWRD Bandanaika essentially broke away from the UNP and he formed his own party on uh, ethno-religious lines. So that kind of further exacerbated the communal tension between the Sinhalese and the Tamil communities. So what we need to understand is that it was not something that uh, was transpiring within the grassroots level, but it was basically orchestrated by ruling class elites based on political agendas and for other personal uh, reasons. What Asif and Sarala explored briefly, we'll get into in more depth in episode two. Their insight on inequality between the classes and the communities in Sri Lanka has a unique shape because it also suggests that the conflict on the island is finely woven with economic policy. Economically speaking, also, we this, the, the reason why we are here has a history going back to at least 1977 when we uh, went into a Uh, open economy model uh, and the whole economy was geared towards export oriented production and we stopped investing in agriculture we stopped investing in domestic industries and our main main uh, economic kind of areas which brought in remittances were all carried on women's backs right so tea rubber plantation economy garments and migrant labor At this nexus where conflict meets economic exploitation, there is the question of power. 
Democracy in Sri Lanka has taken a hit due to the poor decisions made by those in power. And although it is technically a democratic nation, it is in our name, the Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka, which should mean power is distributed to affect policy in the interest of all. It sometimes feels like power in Sri Lanka is dangerously centralized. Now, not all will agree with this statement. Here is Melinda Rajapaksha explaining his position. Now, Melinda is the spokesperson for Gotabe Rajapaksha. Yeah, that Gotabe Rajapaksha. That name will come into play in a major way throughout the podcast. So I worked with Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksha from 2016 when we established Viat Maga, which is a professional uh, network, which uh, went to become probably the biggest professional network of Sri Lanka ever, uh, which helped him to win the election, which I think attracted at me at least 1.5 million uh, voters to the presidential election. All those members in the family were elected by people from their respective districts. No one was appointed or taken by uh, from a wish list of anyone. All of them contested, ran for elections, won in their respective districts, and came to the parliament. And all three big brothers, Mahindra Rajapaksha, Basil Rajapaksha, and Chamal Rajapaksha, has been polit- in politics from 1971. They have been contesting from 1971 and winning elections and coming to the parliament. So by during the time Mahindra Rajapaksha became the president of the country, Chamal Rajapaksha was one of the most senior politicians in the parliament who became the speaker of the parliament. And uh, others, the two sons, Namal Rajapaksha and Shashindra Rajapaksha, Namal Rajapaksha, Mahindra Rajapaksha's son, who won the election from Hambantota district, came to number one and came to the parliament. Shashindra Rajapaksha, Chamal Rajapaksha's son, who won the election from Monarakala district and came to the parliament. Yeah, so so people have opportunity to elect them. And people had opportunity to defeat them too. Like Mahindra Rajapaksha and the, everyone was defeated in 2015. Now in the, in the next election also people can decide whether they can defeat them or keep them. I mean, that's how the democracy works. I mean, people have the opportunity to elect George Bush and son, Clinton and wife. Uh, in India, uh, the Gandhi family, or whoever, wherever. I mean, people have the, none of, none of, everyone has contested, everyone has put their name and fought against a candidate. Even here, it is the same situation. People can decide. People are intelligent. People have elected them. People have defeated them. It is not that they were in power forever. Like now, 10,000, 20,000 people came to the road and kicked out Gotabe Rajapaksha, who was the most powerful president ever. We are the nepotism. No one could protect them. That's how the democracy works. So I think this nepotism story is just a bullshit propaganda story which we have maintained for a long time when it comes only to Rajabaj but even in UNP. Sajid Premadasa is Premadasa, President Premadasa's son. My next guest, Sandun Tudugala, is a figure in grassroots social activism and human rights and a member of the Law Society group that focuses on land rights, legal rights, poverty and policy. I went further down the garden path with him into Sri Lanka's past and the relationship between leaders and power, control and democracy. I asked him, is history repeating itself? If it's democracy has been interpreted as people are allowed to select their leaders, yes, we are a democracy. Our democracy mm-hmm. participation in a way ends within the election. No, We select the leaders and we send them to the parliament or Brussels, and after that, it's entirely up to them. So like citizens participation in governance, if we, if we kind of identify democracy as part of like citizens being able to participate in decision making processes, irrespective of their ethnicity or their class or their social background, I don't think we are a democracy because over the last few decades, decision making processes has been limited to the very few people who are, who holds the power and who comes by from the various kind of like a, elite backgrounds. So ordinary citizens were not able to take part in decision making. So like this kind of anger which we've seen over the last few months with the crisis has also been like a result of that. So basically, if you are allowed to, if you are thinking of democracy as being a, like being like able to select your leaders, yes, we are a democracy. But if you think of democracy as like a 
process of where you have right to take decisions which kind of have an impact to your life i don't think we are we are we are at that stage while i spoke to sadun i also decided to speak to an opposing voice you've heard him a little earlier this is melinda rajapaksha politics in this country is a shit culture then the people who are electing them are also very shitty citizens that is why we are in this situation nothing else the citizens can't just this this how wonderful citizens can be after they elect bunch of idiots to govern you and then from the day you elected them you are complaining about them hello you had the opportunity to make the decision not that anyone forcefully entered the parliament or any other governing place again this you have to go back to the context the major two issues are coming from 1977 where the ump leader jr jayawardena introduced this electoral system in this electoral system you need millions of money to go for election no way in the world i have seen this kind of electoral system everywhere in the world there's now you know in in wherever you do, the people contest for a designated electorate now here you are contesting in the entire district for that election and you are not contesting against opposition in sri lanka you are contest against your same party people to get more preferential votes so you have to spend so much of money through the entire district for advertisement uh, to put to a number out because it's all about getting 100000 of preferential votes so this electoral system has created such a bad system where anyone comes to elections needs a lot of money uh, to promote yourself so you have to go back to big boys to get that money and after you get elected you have to pay them back you have to pay them back so that is the same thing happening from 1977 now so which which educated person wants to be in that game still there are a lot of educated people doctors lawyers engineers good artists there are a lot of good people who still came to the parliament somehow but it's such a difficult task such a difficult task if, if there is a local government election sorry the parliament election next day if i want to contest in my hand i need 50 million ready for tv advertisements paper advertisements for rallies to organize all that shit otherwise how am i going to promote myself from kalambu district this corner from kalambu to avisave do sri lankan people actually have the power to make decisions or is it that they aren't empowered enough to implement the said power the consequences of this have been devastating leading to executive presidencies among other things where those in power have risen above the law see my family where my mom's side of the family are farmers and they still farm to this day in valimada sri lanka most of my aunties and uncles have historically been staunch supporters of a particular political persuasion they used to tell me they bleed blue they brought into the ethno nationalistic ideology popularized by the first political dynasty of sri lanka the bandaranaikas then subsequently by the rajapaksha dynasty i say this because they may have changed their minds on the back of what happened in sri lanka as farmers their livelihoods were impacted due to the ban of pesticide we will talk more about the ban of pesticides in a coming episode recently i spoke to a tuk tuk driver in sri lanka about democracy and he said when we had a king we had one corrupt leader to deal with now we have a democracy we have to deal with 700 kings and their corruption economist and mp harsha de silva and i explored the question on everyone's mind what allows the president of a democratic nation to act like a monarch we have a very complex mechanism of governance also because we have an executive president and we have a parliament and i mean so it's a it's a mix of like an american system and a british system right so where we we are like like in the in the us the president mm-hmm. does not pick his cabinet from the congress he brings people from outside congressmen and senators remain in the 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 congress and the senate whereas you know say in england or i mean the india 
the prime minister picks the cabinet from the parliament legislature, right? So here you have a president uh, that picks uh, his cabinet from the legislature and it's a, it's a mixed system. So there's been quite a bit of debate that we should either go to one or the other. And, and the debate has mainly been that the executive presidential system in Sri Lanka is too powerful uh, and that a single person can essentially ruin a nation. Uh, which is what has happened. And recent polls by various think tanks have very clearly suggested that the people are willing to uh, go through a constitutional change and perhaps uh, get rid of this very powerful executive presidential system. Now, uh, while several amendments to the constitution uh, had taken place, every time the Rajapaksas came, they amended the constitution to make it even more powerful for them. Uh, so this next week, there is going to be an amendment to the existing constitution to reduce the powers of the president. Once again, brought in by a non-Rajapaksa, where Ranil, who is now by, by the constitution itself, serving out the remaining term of the Gotabe Rajapaksa presidency. And if that happens, some of the powers uh, will be reduced. So this debate continues. And yes, we need to find a better constitution. We need a new constitution, really, to make it uh, take this country out of this damn mess, both politically and economically, uh, that we are in. The Sri Lankan constitution has been formally amended 20 times since August 2020. It is only Sri Lanka's third constitution since independence. For comparison, the American constitution has been amended 27 times since its inception in 1787. What lies in its pages that allows poor policies to roll over the greater interest of Sri Lankans? How does the existing constitution fail its people? I needed to find out more. Dr. Harunya Marasuria, a pioneering MP in her own right, added some color to our discoveries by speaking about the imbalance that has always existed. A crisis that was in the making for years finally erupted in the last two and a half years. Ever since independence, I think uh, I think Sri Lanka has been struggling to really come up with a, with a social contract, you know, in terms of the, the rulers and, and citizens, the political establishment and the citizens. That was, that was really fair by all or, or was able to deliver equally to all the different communities that lived in Sri Lanka. And I think the, the our inability to really arrive at, a, at, at one that was um, just, uh, just and fair for all erupted in, cri- in different forms of crisis at different points in our history, whether it's the Northeast conflict, whether it's the insurrections in the South. All of these are manifestations, I think, of, of that struggle that citizens in this country have been dealing with uh, over decades. I think the last several years, uh, the political culture became particularly corrupt and particularly self-serving and uh, dominated by uh, a, a, a few families. And that really pushed the country to its edges. And, and the COVID crisis, plus terrible mismanagement by the, uh, by the Gotabe Rajapaksa government of, of basic sort of economic uh, policy, pushed the country over the edge. And, and, and I think people, the average citizen in this country felt that they've had enough and it was time to take back their power. I mean, the, the Rajapaksas are, are definitely very much, I, I think they symbolize this, this, uh, this corrupt, exploitative political culture that we've had for the, for ever so long. I mean, they, they exemplify it, but certainly they're not the only ones to, to be blamed. I mean, uh, one of the first things that Gotabe Rajpaksa did when he got, when he became president was to set up this commission, uh, made up of a, of a disgrace, uh, headed by a disgraced, uh, judge, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to bring in all the cases that had been filed against him and his family and his associates as, uh, as, uh, in, uh, as cases of uh, political victimization. 
And this commission basically recommended dismissing most of those uh, uh, cases and, and, and put a stop to many of the investigations that were going on. Coming to the present day, under a new default presidency, what role have the Rajapakshas played in this game? In the next episode, I want to dig deeper. I want to come to the present day. I want to understand what role the Rajapakshas have played. These polarizing figures who generally have been painted as the bad guys. I'm interested in the whole story, which I suspect goes a lot deeper. What you have heard so far is just the tip of the iceberg. We'll find out next as we delve deeper into the Civil War era, how the Rajapakshas rose to power and cemented themselves as the most powerful dynasties in South Asia, and how the family, once heralded as gods, would later become Sri Lanka's most hated 